So I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, I'm delighted to see such a large crowd for what promises to be an interesting presentation. My name is Patrick Kennelly and I'm a committee member on both the Cork Region of Engineers Ireland and the Young Engineers Society of Cork, who together are co-hosting the webinar on Dundero Solar Farm, which was completed in partnership by EI Lilly Kinsale and Inner Power. Tonight, we are also very happy to have in attendance the current president of Engineers Ireland, Professor Orla Feely, who will say a few words before the presentation. The presenters tonight are Eamon Judge from Eli Lilly and Luke Deepsey from Inner Power. They will soon discuss Dundera Solar Farm, sustainability, photovoltaic power generation, and much more. And we will finish up with some time for a Q&A at the end. All questions, just to remind anyone who hasn't used this platform before, all questions should be submitted into the Q&A function and not the chat, as these will not be reviewed. So before we go any further, I'll give a small bio on the participants. Professor Orla Feely is the President of Engineers Ireland and Vice President of, for Research, Innovation and Impact, and a Professor of Elect Electronic Engineering at University, um, and University College Dublin, UCD. Orla holds a BE degree from UCD and MS and a PH degrees from the University of California, UC Berkeley. Or as a member of the Royal Irish Academy and a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, Engineers Ireland and the Irish Academy of Engineering. She's a director of the Young Scientist and Technology Exhibition and a deputy chair of the Higher Education Authority. We are also joined by Eamon Judge, who is currently a senior director in Eli Lilly's global engineering function and in recent years has been responsible for the strategic planning for over 1 billion of capital investments in Europe and Asia. Eamon graduated from University College Dublin with a BA Honours in Chemical Engineering and joined Eli Lilly in Kinsale in 1980. Over the last 42 years, Eamon has worked in many areas of Eli Lilly, including director level positions in HSC, manufacturing IT, automation, supply chain operations and engineering. His time with Eli Lilly has included relocating for a number of years in the mid-90s to corporate headquarters in Indianapolis in the United States and also completing an EMBD at Purdue University. Eamon is a former member of the Council of Biopharma Kim Ireland, the industrial associated representation representing the biopharm sector in Ireland. Up to 2021, he was the president of the Ireland affiliate of the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineering, and he has led the Life Sciences COVID Alliance response. Dundera Solar Farm was somewhat of a personal project for him, and he won't mind me saying, as while it originally didn't fall within his cur current um, global remit, it was, he was eager to develop it into a flagship project for Ireland due to his longstanding interest in sustainability. Um, finally, we have Luke Deedsey. He is the Director of Operations for Inner Power. Luke holds an Honours Degree in Electrical Engineering with HDIP in Project Management and C in Status with EIEI Ireland and IET UK, as well as Europe, in, European Engineer Status with the European Federation of Engineers. Luke has over 10 years experience in various environments, including HV and renewables, mining, oil and gas, commercial and industrial. Luke is responsible for all elements of projects delivered from Innerpower, from concept design, um, from concept to design, through to the, the procurement, delivery, QEHS, commissioning, handover, and maintenance. Since joining Innerpower in 2020, Luke has delivered over 20 megawatts of clean green solar electricity to the businesses across Ireland. During that time, Luke has carried out the full project management and engineering as the sole in house resource for Innerpower on the Eli Lilly project. So there are um, people who will give me speaks today, who will be speaking for us today. And I'll start off by introducing uh, Professor Orla Feely. Thanks very much, Patrick. I'm delighted to be here this evening. Thanks very much to Engineers Ireland Cork Region and the Cork Young Engineers Society for hosting this event and for inviting me to say a few words here. Um, as you know, this is part of STEPS Engineers Week. Uh, this is the week when we celebrate engineering and try to profile the profession by showing all the great things that we are doing for Ireland and for the world. So as to communicate the wonderful attractions of a career in engineering, particularly to students in primary and secondary schools. And I think this is a brilliant example of the really important and creative work being done by engineers. And I hope that those who are here this evening really enjoy hearing all about it. So as you know, we're going to be talking about the country's largest solar farm located in Dundero, County Cork. County Cork, as you will all know very well, is home to a wealth of engineering talent. Some of Ireland's mo mo most you know, significant engineers are 
from Cork uh, and we're very glad to have them. And this year, the Cork region celebrates their 80th anniversary, which is a significant milestone for uh, the region and for us in Engineers Ireland. So as part of the 80th anniversary celebrations, the Cork region has hosted a design competition to propose an innovative, creative and sustainable view of what Cork might look like in 80 years from now or 80 years from last year, the year 2101. And at St. Peter's Church on North Main Street, there's going to be a public display of the entries from the design competition starting tomorrow, Thursday, the 10th of March until Saturday, the 12th of March. And I'd encourage you all to attend this display. I'm sure there'll be some really interesting ideas on show there. Um, I'd also like to encourage you if there are student engineers and professionals here for this evening's presentation, if you're not already involved with the Cork Region Committee or the Cork Young Engineers Society Committee, I'd really encourage you to get involved with those committees. You know, we really need to draw on all the energy and vibrancy of the of the region and of the engineering profession to really make these committees deliver all that we want to deliver. So the AGMs for both will be happening in a few months time. It'd be great to have your involvement. So if you are interested, then you get in, can get in touch with either group through social media or through the sector support team in Engineers Ireland. You can find details on our website. Uh, now, back to this evening's webinar, Dondero Solar Farm, as I said, is the largest solar farm in the Republic of Ireland. It, is it was developed by Eli Lilly in Kinsale and also Enerpower. And you're going to be hearing from both organisations now very shortly. It also featured in Engineers Ireland Engineering Excellent Digital Series, a six part video series, which we, we uh, pulled together to recognise the creative ways in which Ireland's engineers are seeking to support and transform communities. And it's such an interesting time uh, to, to have a talk on this. You know, we're all aware of the appalling crisis in Ukraine um, and we're all aware of the humanitarian catastrophe that is unfolding as a result. We're also very much aware of all the various geopolitical and economic implications, including those relating to oil and gas. So, you know, our energy dependence is under the spotlight as never before. And then, of course, even separate from the conflict, we have the whole question of climate change, sustainability and all those imperatives that haven't gone away despite the many crises that we are dealing with of late in the world. So it's really, really exciting to hear about this. You know, many people, if you stop them on the street, they would think that solar isn't viable in the Republic of Ireland, given the cloud cover we have, given the type of weather we have. But you'll hear here how it absolutely is and how the annual power generated by this solar farm is equivalent to the power consumption of Kinsale Town. So, you know, you have real solutions in action here, and that's what engineering is all about, finding solutions to the big global challenges. And this is a really great example of that. Um, in, in Engineers Ireland, we are very, very strongly committed to sustainability. Just last week, we launched our sustainability plan 2022 to 23, which includes a set of 20 actions, which again, reaffirm our strategic commitment to sustainability and very importantly say exactly what we're going to do over the next couple of years to put that into practice. So we know that both our organization, Engineers Ireland, and the engineering profession that we represent will play an absolutely central role in delivering a sustainable future for Ireland. And we in Engineers Ireland will continue to promote and support climate action measures by supporting the skills development of our members to make sure that they are future proofed for the climate challenge ahead. So um, so finally, then, I'm delighted there are so many of you here this evening from all sorts of backgrounds. We have second level students, we have engineering students, we have engineering professionals all registered to attend this evening. I really hope that you enjoy the presentations from Eamon Power of Eli Lilly and Luke DC of Enerpower. And those of you who are students, I hope that this inspires you if you're in secondary school, inspires you to think about a career in engineering and contributing to sustainability in this way. If you're in college, I hope that this encourages encourages you maybe to think about a career that will drive sustainability forward in very tangible ways. So thanks all very much for being here. And I'm really looking forward to a very, very exciting webinar. Thanks very much, Professor Orla Feely. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, without any further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Eamon and Luke um, to begin their presentation. Thanks very much. Patrick, are you receiving the presentation? Yep, yeah, that's perfect. 
That's fine, just to verify. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and it's really my pleasure to join you this evening to tell you about this um, solar development that Lily and Enerpower have pioneered over the last two years. First of all, thank you so much to Patrick and Professor Feely for the lovely introductions. And uh, we hope at the end of the coming hour, you'll learn something about the, 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 this particular development and realize that solar power is something that, as Professor Feedy mentioned, is really feasible in Ireland. And the project we've outlined is a flagship for other companies going forward. Beforehand, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our uh, the background to place. The background to the site we're talking about this evening. This is the Eli Lilly's manufacturing site just outside Kinsale. Um, it's located about three miles in Kinsale town. Uh, while I'm in a global role, as Patrick mentioned earlier, I spent much of my career at this site and I currently have a, an office based here because I operate out of Ireland at the moment, particularly in the COVID period. Because some of you may not be familiar with pharmaceutical manufacturing, I'm going to open the presentation with a few slides about what we do at this site and some of the medicines we produce. And then we'll dip into the sustainability journey we've gone through and, and then a lot more information on the solar farm itself. OK, so with that, let me tell you a little bit about pharmaceutical manufacturing. At the end of the day, our ultimate objective is, is through safety first and quality always produce medicines for patients. And over recent years, many of you will have seen shots that, like this. Uh, showing uh, the production of COVID, COVID antibodies or COVID vaccines uh, during the COVID crisis. And a lot of people view that as being pharmaceutical manufacturing. And it is one part of pharmaceutical manufacturing. It's what we call drug product manufacturing, which is where the active ingredient that's produced that has the therapeutic effect on a patient is, is, is filled or is packaged into the final dosage form that goes out to a doctor or a nurse or a hospital or indeed a pharmacist are you at home? And obviously over the last year, we've been seeing, been seeing a lot of vaccines being produced, they're parenterals, they're injectables, and they come off a filling line like this one here. However, the active ingredient itself comes from different manufacturing sites. And in this case, I'd like to emphasize and, and introduce you to our site, the Kinsale Manufacturing Site, where we do drug substance manufacturing. The Kinsale Manufacturing Site produces medicines for the world. We supply all markets and we supply a, a series of downstream drug product sites on behalf of Lilly. And we use two different types of technologies on the site. For the first 20, 25 years of the site, and we just celebrated our 40th anniversary, but for the first 25 years, most of our medicines were produced by chemical synthesis. And you would be familiar with some of those types of medicines at home. Simple over-the-counter ones like aspirin or paracetamol. Or I have an example here of an antidepressant, which some people may be familiar with, called Prozac, which was quite famous in revolutionizing the treatment of depression. And nearly all the world's supply of Prozac was actually made in Lily and Kinsale. More recently, in the last 10, 15 years, as knowledge of the human body has increased, the use of recombinant uh, uh, cellular-based treatments uh, to produce uh, medicines for, for, um, for, for mankind have come to the fore. And a lot of, and their term biologics. So what chemical synthesis med medicines are made by combining atoms and molecules together to make a medicine. Um, the biologics are produced by using a process called cell culture. Um, and that is by taking cells, mammalian cells, they can be bacterial cells as well, such as E. coli, but most of them are mammalian cells from uh, a typical source would be Chinese hamster ovaries or mice. They're humanized to produce proteins which are compatible with the body and mimic antibodies that naturally occur in the body. Um, one, one item of note that you may be aware of is antibody treatments were developed as a way of fighting COVID. And actually the Kinsale site was one of the sites in the world that produced an antibody for Eli Lilly. Eli Lilly produced three antibodies to, to help uh, treat uh, COVID patients around the world. One common, some, one item that reference is often made is in comparing biologics and chemical synthesis is the term large molecules and small molecules are used. And if I rescale these molecules to compare them, the small molecule that now appears at the bottom, the chemical synthesis one, is a small molecule versus the larger antibody molecule on the right-hand side. And that term is often used. As you can imagine, those large antibodies are very complex, challenging to make, and very much the end medicine that's produced is very much a feature of the production process that is used to produce them. 
And then finally, the Kinsale site is a development and launch site, and we depend uh, significantly on clinical research and development to supply medicines to us. So with that as a background, let me dig into the site in more detail and tell you more about what we do specifically in Kinsale. We produce medicines for five different therapeutic areas. Uh, they're both small molecule, chemically synthesized and biologically produced. Uh, we have two medicines uh, we're producing for diabetes. We have uh, four medicines for oncology, uh, two medicines for pain, three for immunology, and also some for neuroscience. In fact, at the moment, we're excited because we anticipate in the coming year uh, that Lily will get approval, we hope, uh, for an Alzheimer's treatment, one of the first treatments for Alzheimer's, which is a very much an unmet need in the world. But as you can see, we cover a wide range of therapeutic needs for patients. But in producing those medicines, be it by chemical synthesis and cell culture, we go through a series of process steps. In the end, we wanna make a bulk drug, bulk drug substance and we take in raw materials to achieve that. But obviously we use large amounts of energy, electricity and heat to, to support those operations and process those raw materials forward. And in doing so, we have a very significant focus and have been for many years fo uh, focus on reducing, reusing and recycling all of those inputs uh, to make our processes as sustainable as possible, both in terms of our raw materials by using less raw materials, being more efficient in our processes, having higher yields or reusing them through things like solvent recovery, for example, where we're using solvents to, to produce a particular um, uh, material, or in the case of energy, either using less energy to begin with or recovering energy and recycling it in either our direct production processes or indeed also in our waste treatment environmental processes. So I'm gonna step back a bit. I mentioned that the site has just celebrated its 40th anniversary. I'm with Lily 42 years and I started with the site at the very beginning. And this takes us back, these pictures take us back to the 1970s when Lily acquired the Sweetenham farm and did the initial development of the site, <clears throat> excuse me, on that farm. These are some of the initial buildings uh, when the site started and the initial chemical synthesis operation. Now you can see, in case you're wondering, that's a steam plume uh, coming from one of the process operations on the site. Um, at that time, it was well recognized that operating in a very rural environment close to uh, um, um, what was developing uh, to be a scenic town, a tourist town that was Kinsale, Lily had to be very conscious of its environmental footprint. And accordingly, very early on, it invested heavily in, 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 in uh, preparing for that. One of the things that Lily has invested in for the last 40 years has been in studies of Kinsale Harbour because we treat our own wastewater, but we discharge that wastewater outside the mouth of that harbour. And NUI Galway and their Benthic Studies Department have been studying that harbour now for over 40 years at an investment of over 15 million euros. And we've had over 100 PhDs written up on that harbour confirming that our operations have had no impact on, on, the, um, on the, the, the harbour itself. In fact, some of the data from our studies has justified the investment in, in sewage treatment works for Kinsale Town itself. I, I mentioned earlier about our, re, our reuse, reduce, uh, reduce, reuse, recycle approach for, to, to sustainability. When it comes to waste on site, we either uh, destroy waste on our own site and recover heat from that, or we compost the waste uh, we do not send any non-inert non uh, waste to landfill, uh, or we also use waste to, to uh, energy uh, plants elsewhere in the country, thereby minimizing our environmental impact of those operations. However, over many years now, we've taken other approaches to reducing our, our environmental footprint, and in particular, our carbon footprint, introducing LED lighting across our plant site, and then bringing in uh, other developments such as variable speed drives, which in recent decades, or as a way of using energy more efficiently, rather than have a, having a motor running flat out all the time, by varying the speed on it, you can reduce the energy associated with it. And we've done other initiatives associated with bringing in other equipment to suit our activities. We did approximately five years ago, look sorry, 15 years ago, look seriously at renewable energy for the site. And we, we modeled whether or not we would actually install wind turbines on our site. And this is an artist's impression of what those turbines might have looked like uh, in the valley that we're located in. We decided at the time that given our scenic location uh, on the coast near a very scenic town, it would not be compatible and, and would not be well received by our community. And we decided not to proceed with that um, uh, development. 
but long-standing, we had an interest in what we might do otherwise to improve our energy efficiency. And one of the things we did was we introduced our own power, power plant on site, a combined heat and power facility. It's the small building down in the, in the bottom left-hand corner. And the principle in which it operates, it's a gas engine. It produces electrical power and it produces about 40% of the electrical power that our site uses. Uh, for the technical people online, it's roughly four and a half megawatt out of roughly an 11 megawatt total site uh, base load. But we also recover the heat from that system and use that heat to heat the heating and ventilation systems in our buildings. So overall, by producing energy this way, it results in, in, an, in an overall 25% improvement on efficiency versus us taking those uh, fuel sources independently uh, off the grid or externally. So that was one of our initiatives about eight years ago to improve our sustainability. But we always wondered, was there anything else we could do uh, in terms of improving our footprint? And out of the blue, about four years ago, uh, I got a phone call from somebody who was involved in solar development and raised the prospect of us possibly developing solar power at our site in Kinsale. Like most people today, up to that point, I didn't consider it viable in Ireland. I didn't think we had enough solar energy to justify that. But actually, if you look at some of the energy uh, um, profiles for Ireland and the UK, you can see that the southern coast of Ireland in particular has a notably higher level of energy radiation uh, received than perhaps the rest of the, uh, the countries. But actually, as you go back up the country with the increasing efficiency of solar panels and decreasing costs of those panels, particularly as China has got into making large quantities of solar panels, the economics of solar has now improved substantially. Uh, and um, as you look at this graph, by the way, you may wonder why is it curving and why aren't they straight lines? Because solar is a function of latitude. The, the, the data on this graph is, is adjusted to reflect the weather conditions in our respective countries and adjusting for the impact of cloud and rain on solar, um, 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 solar generation. Uh, because not only do you have the issue of latitude, how far north you are, you also have the impact of weather on solar generation. So we, we went away, we took that initial lead and looked at our own site and identified that we had some land, circled in yellow here, that we weren't going to develop immediately ourselves. It was too distant from our site and, and the wrong elevation, but it looked like it was very suitable for potentially being a solar development. One particular interest to us was not to have any impact on our neighbours. And as you can see in this artist impression, the anticipated appearance of the farm was such that it would not be very visible to our neighbors uh, around the site. And actually the nearest neighbor was going to be about 500 meters away. So we, we developed the project further, we identified it and we started the planning process uh, for uh, building the farm. In, in modeling its, 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 its output, we identified we could produce about six gigawatt hours of power a year. So to put that into another way of expressing it, it's equivalent to about 6 million hours of a one kilowatt uh, um, uh, electric heater running. Uh, and that is the yield from 16 acres of panels. We had 20 acres available, but there were some constraints on the land, particularly the fact that there were some archeological remains near the land, which we wanted to protect. Um, and, and also we wanted to retain all the hedgerows and trees around the land and not impact that. So that th they would have shielded part of the land and reduced the area to be developed. At peak output in the middle of the summer, the solar farm would displace about 65% of our site's imported electricity. Uh, we have, we've capped the output of the, of, the, um, the, of the farm at about four megawatt um, uh, at peak outputs in the summertime. So with this, I'm going to hand on to Luke, um, um, Luke, Luke DC from Enerpower, who are our partners in the project. And just before handing it on, uh, I should acknowledge that the PM Group uh, joined us to assist us with the development of the farm and some of the early project management activities. And after a commercial bidding process, Enerpower were successful in winning the opportunity to build the farm and become our partner. So over to you, Luke. Thanks, Eamon, and um, thanks, Engineers Ireland, for, for having me. Um, there's, I work for a company called Enerpower, as, as Eamon said, and there was um, about a year of um, competitive tendering there um, with, with PM Group and Eli Lilly before um, the, we, were, we were selected or successful with the tender. So uh, just a small bit about Enerpower. Um, we've been in operation since 2005 and in the renewable sphere since then. So we started out with biomass boilers, 
and back in 2005 and in 2010 we started moving into to wind turbines and um, so we have a couple of um, small scale wind turbines around the country one in Keypack there in Watergrass Hill in Cork is the, is the latest one that we've just finished um, and then over the course of that the natural progression was to move into into solar PV and in about 2016 I think we did our first um, solar PV and um, since then it's it's been taking off so um, there's this we've 30 employees we're mainly based out of Waterford and um, this we were honoured, I suppose, to be selected for this project um, and it's Ireland's first solar farm. Before I get into the specifics of that, um, I just wanted to explain just a small bit about solar PV and how it actually generates electricity and the different parts that are involved. So what you see on the screen here is, is um, the different elements involved in a solar panel. So a solar panel in its, in its most basic form is, is a sheet of um, silicone covered with, with glass and conductors. So you'll see there, um, you have a front electrode along with a back electrode. Two different types of semiconductors, one positively charged and one negatively charged. You then have an anti-reflective coating to um, try and minimize the amount of glare coming off the PV panels. Um, and once the sunlight hits it, here in the second, screen, in the second um, part you'll see, it's basically what it does is it excites the electrons in the N-type silicone that then transitions through the junction into the P-type and built into the central junction is a positive and a negative electrode. Now, people might be thinking, we're not in the Middle East here, why is the sunlight, is it really viable? As Eamon said, it is, not alone on the graph behind, but because light is made up of, of lots of different types of waveforms. So um, all the colors are the rainbow, in fact. But if you think about it in relation to just four colors, um, red and yellow, Red and yellow are what generate the most electricity as they pass through the silicone layers. Then you have blue and green, and blue and green generate the most heat. So even on a cloudy day, you'll notice it's bright outside or to a certain level of brightness, even on the cloudiest day. What that is, is different waveforms filtering through the clouds and filtering through the atmosphere. So as long as there is light, we can produce electricity. Okay, we might produce slightly less or slightly more depending on clear blue skies, but that's actually how solar still works here in Ireland. On the, the slide on the, the last side is you might think, okay, one solar PV panel isn't going to do much, but solar PV panels are very similar to batteries. They can be stacked and connected in both parallel and series or a combination of both. So here's just a small example of, of one where you take a single panel, you series it with another panel and you can double the voltage. And then if you parallel up that with another one, with another section of series panels, you can actually double up the current. And what that does is it generates a DC voltage. So there's just a small bit of maths there that you can see by combining them in this way, you can actually get, instead of one panel with 17.9 volts or 5.72 amps, you can double that in both ampage and current up to 35.8 and 11.44 amps. That's just a very simple example. Now, if you take that and you continue expanding that all the way up to you know, 200, 300 panels in a row, you will get to 1500 volts DC or somewhere similar. So I mean, you might just go to the next slide there for me. So if you take a look at this, most solar farms operate on strings of up to 250 volts DC. Now in a string, that means numerous PV panels connected together. Depending on the type of PV panel and the output of those PV panels, um, and that technology is changing day by day. Um, two years ago, the largest PV panel you could buy was 350 watts. Today, you can buy 650, almost 700 watts. So in two years, the technology has almost doubled. So you can, in Eli Lilly, we have the bones of 250 PV panels strung together to generate uh, 1500 volts, and that's at DC. Now, DC is no good to, to Eli Lilly or to the grid or to your home. They all work at AC. So you have a function there for what's called a AC-DC inverter. And it basically converts the DC voltage into usable AC voltage. On your home, you would have 230 volt, which is single phase. So um, there's no problem. You have inverters from DC to 230 volt. Um, in some commercial instances, you would be operating at 400 volt. This being a solar farm, however, and we have a large distance between the farm and Eli Lilly, we have to try and minimize the losses caused by that conversion. 
Unfortunately, electrical conversion isn't seamless and it's not perfect. There is losses along every step of the way up until you get usable electricity at the factory. To minimize those losses, we actually operate the PV panels at 1500 volt DC. We operate the AC grid on the solar farm at 800 volts AC. There's over four kilometers of AC cable on site, so we have to get them all back. And then we have to step them up to a distribution voltage. In Eli Lilly's case, that distribution voltage is 10,000 volts. So the transformer takes that from 800 volts AC up to 10,000 volts, which we would deem medium voltage. It then goes through distribution switch gear, um, which is just a two bay MV switch. And there's more details on that in the, in the next slide. And then it's transmitted on the interconnection cable across to Eli Lilly's facility, or if it was grid connected to the ESP grid, it would be across transmission lines to the local power station or to the local factory. So this is just a slide on some of the elements that are in Eli Lilly, just to show you physically what they look like. So we actually have 12,672 panels, and they're the 455 watt panels on site. Um, just an interesting point, actually, in relation to PV panels and the technology that they have. They come in various forms, and you can actually get PV panels now that are called bifacial, and they will accept, PV, they will accept solar irradiance from both sides of the panel. So what it does is they have a very thin layer on it that allows solar voltage or solar power to pass through it and pass light through it. And then on the back of the panel, it catches the reflection off the ground so that it's double gaining on the solar. Um, they also have mono and, and, um, and half cut cell technology. What we installed on this site is actually half cut cell technology. So in the middle frame there, you can kind of see the large gap between the um, solar rows and you'll see it on another slide here in a second. That large gap is there to minimize shading from the row in front to the row behind. But another reason that we actually selected the half cut cells is um, the top half of that cell can function even if the bottom half is in shade. So what that means is that even at the lowest point in the day when the sun is almost disappearing, the top half of the panel isn't shaded and it's still able to generate electricity. So it's just um, an interesting thing. There is multiple different types of solar panels. We installed 220 ton of, of aluminum frame or steel framing on site and that, um, including piling. It's 22 number AC DC inverter DC AC inverters that you can see there. We use the ABB um, on this site. Down in the, in the bottom corner, you have the LV transformer and MV. We got this, um, it's the first in the country. It was a skid manufactured in Italy by ABB. And um, it's, it's the first in the country. It's purpose built for solar. So it just means we didn't need any large infrastructure or large civil works. There was no large building required. And um, again, cutting down on the carbon footprint of the install. And then we had the, the ESB grid protection as required um, under Egypt rules, and that's a Siemens Cypertech relays and, and coordination. So this is just the, the build sequence here. So as Eamon said earlier, there's 16 acres worth of PV panels, but there's 22 acres on the site. Um, the first sequence is we come along and we mark out the entire three fields, and we put down, um, we take a piling rig and we pile in the C-channel base, and we do that across the entire field. Then we come along and we cut our trenching. And then we come along and we fit our cross members, our PV panels, our inverters, and followed on then we carry out the DC stringing and the AC cabling. And then it's all backfilled and connected up. So um, you'll see there the, the reason the 16 acres, the reason the full 22 acres weren't used as Eamon said was due to archeological reasons. So. Um, we had a full-time archaeologist on site with the digs, just again, um, taking into account the, the, the local community and the importance of, of Kinsale. So um, there was actually a, an axe head found and some arrowheads found, and they were, they, they've been taken off for further examination by Archaeological Ireland. Um, once the PV panels, once the frame is up, we then have another team following behind mounting the PV panels. And... Um, then, as I said, the AC cable is over four kilometers, 36 kilometers of DC cable and 700 meters of MV cable connecting our, the farm across to Eli Lilly. All in all, the project took six months from, from start to finish. So 
it's just just over a month per megawatt on a on a rough on a rough calculation um to to do a solar farm which isn't bad at all considering the um the electricity generated at the back end might go on there Eamon, for me please some of you might be wondering how do we keep the grass down this is our our automatic um, grass cutting solution and um, we have we have 40 sheep in from a local farmer inside the field uh, or the tree fields across the acres and so far they've been doing a very good a very good job they've kept it down all winter and they they headed off there for lambing and they'll be coming back again in the next couple of weeks so um they're a nice addition it adds to the biodiversity um, and we're looking to add further biodiversity on site and um, with wildflower or wild meadow gardens and things like that in the in the unused areas just to extend the biodiversity i think i'll be handing back to Eamon here now to our sorry here's a, a photo of the entirety um, and you can see it's from the road if you actually drive down that road you can't see it and um, you actually cannot see the hedge groves are maintained as Eamon said and there's, there's a video clip coming up shortly, which should show it. And you'll see that there's no large civil infrastructure on site at the end. There's just a, um, in the, at the north end of the middle field, um, there's just a, the skid and an MV cable going linking across down. You can roughly see the path that it took down into Eli Lilly's facility. So it's, it's very unintrusive. Um, you don't really see it in the surroundings. As I said, if you drive down the road, you actually won't see it at all. So I think, Eamon, I'll be handing back Good, to you now for we have a video. Yeah, and we're going to move on to say, you'll see it in the video, but just pointed out here, this tree was one of the trees retained, and you could see where the solar panels were deliberately avoided behind that tree as it was developed. So let's move on here, and I'll play this video. I, I don't think there's any sound on it, but I'll talk through it. It's very short. Start, start with, this is the ground level view, and as Luke said, behind this hedgerow is where the solar par, par, far, farm is. And you can see the houses in our vicinity in the surrounding distance. And to be honest, for most people in our locality, until it was on the 6-1 news uh, last July when we opened it up with um, Taoiseach visiting and our CEO, most people in the community didn't even know it existed. Um, but let me take you on a drone flyby so you get a sense for its scale. So this was July last year when we first went online with the, uh, the solar farm. And in a few minutes, I'll show you some of its output. You can see all of the 12,600 panels that Luke was describing earlier, uh, evenly spaced out over the land, and then the hedgerows in between. We, we went through, Eli Lilly managed the planning application for this, and we consulted with Cork County Council to make sure that there were no issues associated with developing the site, including protection of any archaeological remains. And then you could see in the distance the manufacturing site uh, that we supply to. So when we jump up here, the substation is where the, my cursor is. I, I presume you can see it. And then we connect from there by, a, by a, 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 an underground cable into the main manufacturing plant site. So hopefully that gives you a sense of it. I'm going to pause the video at this stage and move to the next slide if I can get it to move on and tell you a little bit more about what the solar panel farm has actually done since it went live. So here's a typical day, September 30th, 2021. And you can see the profile of generation over the course of a day. The energy output goes up and goes down, depending on clouds passing over the, um, the, 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 the farm and whether it covers it or not. And underneath here, you see the output of each individual inverter. As um, Luke mentioned earlier, we've 22 of those inverters that convert the DC direct current voltage from the solar panels into the alternating current that we need and that most people use in their power, uh, in, in normal power use. Uh, those inverters switch on and off. And you can see this blue one jump down a bit. It may have been at that time that that part of the farm was covered by a cloud and the other, other parts were not. To give you a comparison, however, if I go to the next slide, this is the equivalent output of the farm in December, December 21st, the shortest day of the year. Um, you can see the day is shorter. The, the, the day, by the way, it's on the same scale. Uh, the, both graphs are on the same scale. The day is shorter, and obviously the amount of energy, gener gener energy generated is reduced. So that is one of the challenges with solar power, particularly in Ireland, is that while it can generate a lot of power in the summertime, it is seasonal in terms of impact. But as time goes by and we come up with ways of storing power, there may be ways of overcoming some of those challenges. This is the previous day, September 29th. And the reason we picked this out is this was a perfect day. Clear blue skies for the whole day. Uh, early in the morning, I think about 7 o'clock or 7.30, the sun came up. 
went to full output from all of our, our inverters and then dropped away in the evening down into 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. In, in the evening. So it just, just shows you the comparison. The, the yield data that we talked about earlier at the very beginning took account of the fact that this is a more normal weather profile in Ireland. So, you know, we didn't build a solar farm assuming every day would be like this. We made allowance for those, those, those differences. Um, and I believe that, that is coming up in this slide here. So just to, to summarize this here, if you look day by day, you can see uh, from September 8th to the end of October, or the beginning of October, each day you see a different amount of power generated. This is the cumulative power generated each day, depending on whether it was cloudy or otherwise. Some days, a day like this may have been raining. A day like today would have been, was very poor in terms of solar generation because water rain falling on the panels reduces their output substantially. Uh, then when we look at the period since the plant came online, this was last July. Well, we only started the plant up at the back end of July. So that's why that's low. August was pretty much a full month. We were close to 700 uh, megawatt uh, hours of output. And then uh, progressively, then it dropped down as we went through the, the seasons uh, continuing on from there. This um, uh, graph here shows the model performance. I think I actually have a bigger version of it next door I have here. And this is the output from a model that is available. So if people online are interested in seeing how much solar power you can generate at your own house, um, the European uh, Commission have a research body called JRC based in Italy, and they've developed a modeling system called PVGIS, whereby, whereby you can go onto uh, the, the model, you can pick out a map, pick out where your house is, uh, put in your air code, it works with air codes, and then you can put in details of the way your house is angled, uh, uh, and it will automatically tell you, based on current um, um, photocell technology, uh, solar technology, what the likely power generation per square meter or per panel might be at your house. And it's adjusted to take account, take account of the weather that would have been at your house over the last five or six years. So what they do is they aggregate no normal weather in, in the location to adjust for that. The blue line that you see here was what was modeled for this particular site. Uh, and as you can see, it goes up and down. And because you know, the five years of data is variable, you see variation from day to day. And the orange is what we've actually seen. So look, they don't line up because of different weather on different days from year to year. But on average, if you look at the trend, you can see that actually the output is very much very closely modeling um, the actual, okay? And again, it's worth looking up that yourself if you're interested in it. So in terms of solar generation per year, and in this presentation here, I'm referring not only to the, to, to the, the uh, farm we've just built, but we've another development coming, which Luke is about to tell you about, uh, is included in this. And the com combination of the two of them, phase one and phase two, is about eight gigawatt hours per year. Um, if you look at what's the benefit of that in terms of sustainable uh, uh, benefits, first of all, in terms of carbon reduced, it's equivalent to the reduction of three and a half thousand tons of carbon uh, reduced to the, uh, the, the air based on the average mix of power consumption in Ireland. But if you consider that this might be displacing perhaps power produced by Money Point in, 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 um, in, in um, Clare, which is coal generated, the amount of, of carbon reduced is actually substantially higher than this. But we would say it's of that order. We also, by setting up the system to feed directly into the factory, into the manufacturing site, not going out on the grid and us taking it locally, we avoid losses that occur across the distribution pylons. And that's of the order of 15% of the power produced. So that's a benefit. I mentioned previously, uh, and it was mentioned that it powers over a year, the equivalent of what Kinsale Town would use. But another um, aspect of it that people might be interested in is its comparator to planting forestry. Because many people have asked us the question, well, why are you putting solar panels on those, that land? Why don't you just plant trees? Well, the solar power generated in terms of carbon reduction or sequestration is equivalent to 7,000 acres of forest forestry. So substantial difference there. If you want another comparison, it's the same uh, power generated or energy as a return car trip to Australia or 800, almost 700 million mobile phones charged, a quarter million gas cylinders or 2 million liters of fuel. So whichever measure you want to pick, it's a, it's a, a substantial contribution to 
uh, reducing energy footprint. And part of the reason that Eli Lilly invested in this is we saw this as a flagship project which we could develop. And maybe we could encourage other companies and other groups to do the same thing. And since it's, it's gone live in July, I've been approached by over nine different companies asking to learn about our experience because they're considering something similar. We, we had no sooner had developed our own phase one development, which is the 16 acres that we described previously, than we identified that perhaps we could use more solar power. And we identified some land adjacent to the site. Uh, it's not owned by Lily, but owned by uh, another landowner who was willing to take part and partner with us. And we identified we could develop an 11 acre expansion. And I'm gonna hand back to Luke just to comment on that. Yes, yeah, so um, I suppose Eli Lilly were, were very happy with um, how phase one was going and the electricity production and its interaction with their site. But um, phase one is a fully south-facing system. So as, as Eamon's graph showed there, um, we, have a, we have a lovely high peak in the, in the middle of the day. But um, on, sorry, on the 30th of September on the perfect day. But um, what we've done then as part of phase two to try and provide a more steady load into, into our more steady electricity supply. Sorry, we're, we're selling, we're sending electricity, not, not using it. And um, so what we're doing is we're setting up phase two as an east-west facing. So an east-west facing will gather most of its sun in the morning and the evening with an average platform in the center of the day. So what that will allow us to do is um, hopefully provide a better, uh, a steadier load profile into Eli Lilly with a higher peak in the morning, uh, a steadier load throughout the entire day and keeping up that where it was tapering off from three o'clock to eight o'clock on the graph that you saw earlier, we would be open, we'd be able to keep up closer to um, our maximum production up until six or seven. So this is kind of the, uh, the, the model there. And that's, that's the idea of the expansion is to try and supply Eli Lilly with a, a steadier load profile and, and um, uh, greener electricity in the mornings and the evenings rather than just peak in the middle of the day. And that's, that's well underway at the minute. Um, I think we're, we're due to be finished it there in, in the coming month or two. So Lilly has a corporate objective, global objective to be net zero in terms of our power usage, our energy usage by 2030. To that end, we have a number of uh, uh, develop, similar developments gone across the world. Historically, going back about 10 years ago, we previously invested in a solar farm adjacent to one of our plants in New Jersey. On the right hand side here on top, we have a, plan, a development that's currently underway in Strasbourg in France. Uh, it'll be completed in about a month, whereby they did not have any spare land, but they're covering their car park with solar, solar panels. In two of our other sites in Puerto Rico, we do have some spare land. And obviously in Puerto Rico, it's much further south near the equator. So they farm more sunshine and they're looking at developing a solar farm there. And also in Florence in Italy, we have another manufacturing site. They don't have much land, but they've covered all the roofs of their buildings with solar panels. And I should add, by the way, one of the buildings on the Kinsale site also has solar panels on its roof. But um, the, the, the improvement in scale and reduced in reduction in cost by doing a large scale development over many, many acres uh, makes this type of development much more attractive. Additionally, some of you may have heard in the last month that Lily announced that we're going to build a new manufacturing site, a second manufacturing site in Ireland in Limerick. This is uh, an artist's impression of what that site will look like. Um, construction on it will start later this year. But what I want to bring to your attention is at the back of the site here, it's out of shot. Uh, we have, uh, I'm not sure the exact amount of area, I think it might be up to eight or nine acres, uh, will be covered with solar panels to supply this particular manufacturing site as well. And you can also see on the roofs of the buildings, we're including some solar developments. So it's part of a, an ongoing um, uh, focus Lily has on sustainability. And to date, we've been very, very pleased with our results. Obviously, in recent times, recent weeks and days, as well as months, as Professor Feely mentioned earlier, we've seen the tragedy of the Ukraine um, 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 invasion uh, evolve. We've also seen, however, the effect of that on energy prices across Europe. And that has mean, meant that the benefit we're getting from the solar generation we're seeing is, is very significant. And it's making solar and renewables much more feasible going forward. So that brings to a close our formal presentation. Uh, I believe we have about 10 minutes to go on this scheduled time for the webinar. 
And at this stage, Luke and I are very open and would be delighted to answer any answer any questions you have about the presentation or any related items. Um, so with that, I think I might hand back to Patrick if you're there as MC. Yeah. Thanks very much, um, Eamon and Luke. That was a very absorbing and interesting presentation. It was great to get a history of Dundera plant, including an overview of the drug manufacturing and the other sustainability initiatives. Um, the solar PV basics section and the build sequence were particularly informative. And, uh, and I also really liked the, the, the I thought the, the yield data section as well gave a kind of a, a good um, indication of what you're producing there. And um, I definitely found the, the solar generation comparison comparisons very enlightening. You know, it's kind it's good to get a, a, a comparative um, uh, information on that. So um, without um, further um, ado, I'll go. I'll move on to the the questions here that we've uh, we've uh, got a few questions in. Um, there's one in particular that seems to have copped up by it's it's just three different people have asked a similar question. Um, uh, Louise Rowe has asked, uh, in terms of the business care for the solar fire, what is the payback period for the project? Gavin Kelly has asked, what is the estimated payback period for the installation? And also Declan Whelan has also asked, it, you know, he said it's a great project and presentation and what's the project cost and what is the payback pro projection? So similar yeah. similar questions there from, from three. I years. suppose uh, as the client of the site, I'll, I'll comment on that. Um, we have stated and commented publicly that the overall cost of the um, of the development was between five and six million euros. Uh, of that, it's split out between an investment by Eli Lilly to, to build an interconnector between the solar farm and, and the site itself. And then the remaining uh, cost has been shared by Lilly and, and Enerpower on a 20 year payback basis. And, it, and the, as people will understand, the terms of that are confidential. But overall, at the time, in terms of the investment Lilly was making, we initially anticipated something like a four to five year payback. But frankly, as energy costs have changed since the, the project was developed in the last two years, that has shrunk down to be closer to in the region of one to two years. Uh, for our investment, but um, it's 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 uh, very viable for us um, as it stands. Thanks very much. Um, I have another one here from Kate Scally. What happens at the end of life of the solar farm? Luke, do you want to? Yeah, I'll take that. So, um, as part of I suppose the the design life of this solar farm is twenty years, and um, that's that's the design life. And um, if you look after it, obviously you'll be hoping it, it'll last longer. So, um. When we submitted the planning permission, we had to submit a restoration plan to remove everything out of the field, um, out of the three fields and return them back to normal. Um, but our hope is um, at the end of the 20 years, the solar PV panels based on the degradation are still supposed to be in the region of 80% efficient. Um, the steel frame is certified for 40 years. The transformer and um, the steel frame, the transformer, all the switch gear we got um, rated and protected for the local sea air. So we added extra protection when we did it and we're hoping that it should all still be still functioning at the end of the, the 20 years. And there's new technology coming out. Um, as I said, solar solar is one of those um, areas that you blink and there's, there's, a, there's a phase shift in technology leap forward. So like there's new technology coming out of Cambridge recently that um, it's a, a film that can be applied across existing and new solar solar panels to convert that um, blue and green wavelengths that I was explaining to you earlier, which are actually what caused the degradation of PV panels to red and yellow to both improve efficiency and extend lifetime of panels. So there is a detailed restoration plan available in the planning pack that um, states we would be um, lifting everything up, but there is also an option to extend our planning permission beyond the 20 years and um, look at extending the life of the panel with the life of the system with, with new technology that's coming out and, we, that's what we would be hoping to do rather than um, taking it all up. Hopefully, maybe it will be able to continue continue its life further. Thanks, Luke. Um, I think I just might one add I, one item to the previous answer I gave as well. And people have asked about this before. We should we should acknowledge it. One of the things that Lily was particularly pleased with in working with Enerpower is that Enerpower has a long established um, uh, involvement with SAI. The Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland in terms of community uh, um, sustainability projects. 
and under the Better Energy Community Scheme, which they were participating in, uh, that was something that was able to link this solar farm to other uh, projects uh, related to fuel poor communities uh, that they were undertaking and have a joint uh, project submission. So we were very pleased with that as well. Thanks, Eamon. Um, Kevin Fortune asks, does the site export electricity to the electrical grid? Um, um, maybe I, I, I'll comment on the first bit and then maybe you might maybe comment on the controls, Luke. Will we cover it that yeah. way? So um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, we're a large site with a pretty large uh, electrical footprint. Uh, our overall power usage is about 11 megawatts. We generate about four and a half ourselves. We import about six and a half. We are not um, contracted or do not have an export uh, permission with the grid to export. And when we set out to do this development, we consciously decided that we would build it with behind the meter focus namely we would decide it to use all the power generated on our site given that we were such a large generator um, but obviously that meant then planning for and designing to prevent such export and with that i'll hand over to luke to comment on it yeah so um in, in short no nothing goes back to the grid um you literally have a large load and and it's all used on site but to uh, as eamon said their, their grid connection agreement doesn't allow them actually export onto the grid. So um, the and the fact that all the solar produced is consumed on site means even if we wanted to, we wouldn't have access to go to the grid. But just to ensure that we installed um, well, we took we put a lot of control and protection in and a lot of different fail safes in a lot of, um, to ensure that nothing would go back to the grid. And that started with the Egypt controller, which is ESB witness tested and commissioned as per the rules and regulations make sure that nothing does go back onto the grid, just to make sure that Eli Lilly are compliant with their, with their connection agreement. Um, on top of that though, we put in, in um, export limitation. So we don't ever want the ESP rules and regulations around um, export means that if, you, if we ever did, we would end up tripping off the solar farm. And um, that's not something that we want to do. And um, we would have to come back to site to reset it, plus there's downtime. So what we did is we installed um, a sophisticated export limitation system. So we're constantly looking at the Eli Lilly incomer and we're scaling up the solar panel generation to ensure that if we if their load ever does get down close to, to exporting what we're producing, we will scale back the solar production in line with that to make sure that nothing will go to the grid. Mm. And we have, a, we have a certain safety factor on that of import for Eli Lilly. As Perfect. we've added phase two, the second development that we showed you, which is currently under construction, the potential is there to perhaps get to a point where we might have excess power, but that is something we look to in the future in terms of renegotiating our connection agreement to be able to export. Uh, that, that will happen in the future. Uh, Michael Walden Drun asks, how far does the electricity have to travel from the farm to the grid and what would be the ideal distance? In in terms of our on-site farm, I'm trying to remember, we're about 700 meters, if I remember correctly, yeah. Luke, from the transformer. Uh, so from the, the transformer, the um, 800, was it 800 volt to, to 10 kV transformer station at, at the, the, the solar farm. I don't know, can you still see my cursor on the screen? Can, can you see it moving? Can, can you see? No, 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 no the presentation's gone in. Yeah. That's fine. Uh, I was going to point it out to you, but up at the solar farm itself, there was that transformer. It's about 700 meters from there down to a uh, um, ring main unit on our one of our 10,000 10, volt ring loops within the site. So it doesn't go all the way out to the grid. From there out to the grid then through our network is probably another 700 meters. So you'd be talking about a one and a half kilometers all the way to the grid, but it would have to go through our network to get out to it. And just system. in relation to, yeah. yeah, and just in relation to ideal distances, I suppose, like this project is is a behind the meter project, right? It's, it's not grid connected. So it's directly, as Eamon said, into his internal 10 kV network or Eli Lilly's. If you are building a solar farm and it is grid connected, as Eamon said, there is roughly 15% transmission losses down by the time you generate, by the time you generate on site and you send it to <coughs> a power plant or you distribute it to a local distribution network. So the shorter you can keep that, the better. There is no real optimum. If this was a grid connected project, like we would have an on-site ESB substation with a 10 kV overhead line coming in or a 38, sorry, a 38 kV overhead line coming in, maybe even higher at a, a 110, depending on what voltage you're connected at. So 
A lot of people will see Res Connected Projects, which is the Renewable Energy Sport Scheme, uh, Sport Auction, that the uh, Air Grid ran last year. It was Ireland's first one. So there'll be a lot of those grid connected solar farms coming online this year. But the ESP, as part of that connection process, you have to apply to a grid connection for the ESP. But the ESP actually bring the grid connection to your, to your land and you pay, you pay a fee for that. So um, there's no real ideal distance, but the shorter you can keep every electrical connection on site, the less losses you'll have, more usable power. And that was, one of the that was one of the attractions that's developing to us for Lily is the fact that we could mobilize quickly, other than going through the normal planning statutory process for the solar farm itself, in terms of the electrical interconnection, because it's behind the grid, it did not involve us having to get involved in the rest scheme, in, in going through external regulatory steps, which, uh, you know, frankly, do take time and, and uh, you know, uh, are part of a much broader national agenda. That's why we're encouraging companies to look at this as a good interim measure where they can use power them, themselves um, on, on, their, on their sites. Um, I was going to say something else and it's going to my mind, but that's it for me. OK. Uh, thanks. Um, Re asked about the orientation of the panels, but I think that was earlier in the presentation and he covered mm -hmm. that um, later on. Um, Dominic O'Sullivan asks, was there any major issues with the supply chain during the six month uh, project, given that with the current global challenges? Um, I, I suppose from our side, no, we were lucky enough. Um, it was built, as I said, we started last Oct or Oct October 2020 mm -hmm. um, and it was it was finished in, in 2021. So we the biggest problem at the time was the, the Suez Canal and the delays, but we had actually received all of our PV panels prior to that. Um, we had a, a slight delay on the MV skid or the LV to MV skid coming, but it was only delayed by three weeks. So um, we, were, we were very lucky and it was built in Italy. So, um, you know, we were able to, we flew over there, we were able to inspect the, the factory and check that everything was, was happening. So that was the biggest delay, it was only three weeks. We had all of our PV panels in a bulk order and we obviously had other solar projects ourselves um, outside of the Eli Lilly. So we had placed quite a large order of panels well in advance of, um, of actually needing them on site. I think they were one of the first things delivered to site. And um, before the frames were even there, the PV panels were there. So um, it was mainly just a just a three week delay on the on the special skid that we got designed to build. I just remember the other comment I was going to make, Patrick, and that is that while th this is currently the largest solar farm in Ireland, and when we add on the additional area later this year, we will grow to roughly twenty six acres. There are a number of very large mega utility level farms being built around the country, 100, 150, 200 acres. So we won't hold that record for a while, but for long. But in terms of a behind the meter, totally contained local development, we think this is going to be quite unique for quite a period of time. Um, Brendan Barry asks, um, he says, thanks very much for the informative presentation. Were the roofs of the buildings ever considered as a potential location for the panels? And if so, why were they ruled out? Yeah, very early on, it was looked at. And in fact, one of the buildings in the middle of the site now has solar panels on it. Um, one of the early concerns I had, but it was proven later to be due to a very particular local issue, was reports were developing in the US of uh, fires associated with solar panel roof solar panels um, specifically there was a particular um, um, a number of Walmart stores it, it, uh, had, had issues but when that was and our insurers then would have a great concern about that type of risk on the fact that we had very valuable and very expensive manufacturing uh, facilities on our site as it turned out I believe those issues were due to installation quality specific to a particular installer so it, it wasn't going to be a big deal otherwise <clears throat> but be honest when we started looking at it and looking at the benefit of the scale associated with uh, the land we had available to us, it was just compelling versus the complexity of going and doing individual buildings. Uh, we do still have a lot of building space, but I'll be honest, we have far more opportunity in terms of um, on land uh, development. Yeah, and um, just just to, to back him and up there, like you have to remember, even at full full out peak on phase one, we're producing 65% of the, the energy usage for, for Eli Lilly on, on the best day of the year at peak output. But roof space is very limited. So like if we put 40 kilowatts, it's not going to make too much of a dent in the overall electrical needs of, of Eli Lilly, which is uh, on their roofs. Mm. 
it'll all help towards the caravan. Yes, it will. But we can fit 40 kilowatts in less than one row that's behind you there, if you know what I mean. So probably a third of a row, maybe even less. So, um, you know, when you, when you compare it to if the land is available, it's, it's much more beneficial to do it at scale than trying to fill every roof. The other problem with, with filling all the roofs is that um, the grid protection required all has to be interfaced. So then you need links between every single building. You need multiple trips. You need multiple fallbacks, multiple protections. From a maintenance point of view, Eamon would need to shut down one section of the solar of a, a PV array or potentially shut down multiple PV arrays just to maintain one, one building so that he could ensure that there was no backfeed for maintenance on that building. So on the scale that Eli Lilly has, it, it's this makes sense, but there are other places out there. We have upwards of 95, um, 95 last count, I think, last week of solar installations on rooftops. So they do also work, but just at the scale Eli Lilly required, it wouldn't really make too much sense to fill every single roof. And actually, to be fair, there was a slide that we had in the deck, but we lost it somewhere along the way. Uh, as Luke was introducing Enerpower, it showed some pictures of previous developments by Enerpower, one of which was the largest development of the country prior to this one that we've looked at tonight, which was a little distribution centre, and I believe it was about 1.7 megawatt DC output. Uh, if you correct me, Luke, if I have it wrong. Yeah, it, it was one. It was, was 1.2, and uh, that was in 2019, 2021, or 2020, sorry, 2021 was um, Sam Dennigan's at 1.5 megawatts over in Dublin, and now we've just energised Bulmers, and um, it was just released in the paper the other day, Bulmers and Clonmel, 2 megawatt peak. So they're, they'd be top three, top three in the country, and we just finished a megawatt also for um, Cisco above in Dublin. Mm -hmm. And a number of those, I think most of those were roof mounted, just to make they it were all they were all roof mounted, yeah. Because there were large roof areas. So roof, roof is feasible if you've got the area, but for us to go to the scale, we're up now up at close to eight, eight, and well, in terms of DC, it's more like nine and a half megawatt. Yeah. Uh, so relatively speaking, substantially more. Thanks very much. We're running over, over time a good bit already, but there's about five or six. Yeah, there's about there's about twenty more questions, but I'll try and I'll try and group a few of them more. together. We, I try and group a few of them there. Um, Ed, Hart, Ed Hartnett and John Smith, they both asked a similar enough question um, in relation to the how is the system cleaned and maintained? Do you want to call oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so um, no, one of the biggest problems in, in maintaining a, a solar system of this scale is the, is the grass. As you saw, we have, we have our sheep in there and there's 40 of them at the minute. So they managed to keep all the grass down couple of problems with the grass is if it gets too high or it touches the even the back of the PV panels, let alone shading on the front, but on the back of the PV panels, okay. it'll actually cause heat, heat spots or hot spots, which will further degrade the panels than, than what they're meant to be. Um, we actually arrange the orientation of these at 22 and a half degrees. So um, what that means is that the we over exaggerated the tilt. Um, optimum would have probably been around 20. Um, so we over we over exaggerated the tilt on this just by two and a half degrees. The reason for that is that the water runoff from the vast amount of rain that we have here should take care of um, two lots of intermittent cleaning. And that's what we're seeing. That's why you're seeing the system is up and running six months. And Eamon showed the are over six months now. Sorry, apologies. And Eamon showed the graph. You can see that it is tracking as per the model for the weather data that we have. So when we look at that. We would be saying right now it's not worth it's not worth cleaning. We will review again closer to towards the end of the summer, and um, if we're still tracking on the model, so that model gets updated weekly, and then um, we we take a review at the end of every week whether we should clean or whether we should maintain how the strings are performing, how how it is performing. On site, we also have what's called a weather station, so it tracks the sun sun's irradiance. Um, and it, we have it both on horizontal irradiance as well as on the tilt of the PV panels. So what that allows us to do is it allows us to do a theoretical per meter square of what the solar should be producing right now versus what it actually is producing versus the model. We can then utilize all that data, decide whether the system is performing. And if it's not performing based on the actual irradiance, whatever about the model, we will then decide whether it needs to be cleaned or not. But we currently have it in for cleaning maybe once every 18 months. And that was the that was part of the reason for the additional tilt angle at two and a half degrees. 
And does that help with uh, someone asked there, um, uh, Sula asked, um, is there any significant Im impact of dust? I, I assume the, water, the, the rain helps you there a bit. So, well, the rain helps it, number one. Now, the field behind you looks looks a lot uh, muckier and it might throw up a lot of dust, but it's actually, um, it's covered in lush green grass now since that photo was taken. And um, so there isn't a whole pile of dust. And um, there also isn't a whole pile of, of vehicle movements around the fields. Um, you only have that road. It's quite a rural road. There's a, there's no real houses on it, and then the the field next door is mainly is 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 um it's only kind of cut twice a year. So and it should in theory only affect the 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 field on on to my to my right here. So um at the minute we're not seeing any soiling. We did allow a two percent soiling calculation for dust when we did our model, um and so far we are tracking to the model. So. Um, dust suppression, we have no existing on-site dust suppression, the rain will help to keep it down um, and we are tracking to the model so at the minute we're not, we're not worried about it. It, it it should be factored into into our calculations on the yield return based on a 2% silent factor and Actually, if you want to see the effect of the, the, the slope that Luke mentioned to get rid of rainwater, if I share my screen there quickly, hopefully it'll, it'll display again um, there we go, just share. This is the data from the smudge from today. As people will know in Cork anyway, it was a terrible day here today, this morning. And you can see early in the morning at around nine o'clock when it was torrential rain in this area, there was very little generation. The rain dro dropped off the middle of the day and you can see where we were back generating again at the back end of the day. So just to, as a bit of reference, at this point here, we were close to 2.2 megawatt output um from the from the the the, uh, the system so just for reference perfect um i'll just throw in one here um thanks very much for the presentation very uplifting to see the potential for pv in ireland eamon mentioned energy storage do eli Lilly have plans for that and if so what method okay um very good question we've looked at it because it always comes up in terms of either solar or indeed wind generation the two more obvious items available today one is is proven technology in the form of battery technology uh reality is the battery densities that are available today are such that uh, it's not really feasible uh, uh as an ongoing basis we are looking at it there is some new technology which enterpower i think has identified out of japan and they're currently running the calculations on it to see if if that combined perhaps with a grid support connection uh, what's called a ds3 connection whereby we we act as a support for grid stability might give us the economics to justify it the other area that might be of interest to people is using the solar power to generate hydrogen and then it's using that hydrogen as a fuel source for, for example, our CHP plant. And, and we've looked at that. It's still very much bleeding edge technology. But I would hope if we saw something like what we saw in COVID in terms of you know, a technology effort to bring these things forward faster. And I'll be honest, the energy crisis we're going through at the moment, I think, will lead to this. That may be one of the best options out going forward is to produce hydrogen, store the hydrogen and then use it as a fuel source. Um, Luke, do you want to comment on the, the, the battery question? Yeah, no, it's just, uh, as Eamon said, I suppose the, like, you're talking, it's when this is up, when this is expanded, you're, uh, you're up at 7 megawatts AC, you know, you're 9.6 9 megawatts DC, roughly. Um, you're talking a very large, large battery at that point. Um, now, a large battery for behind the meter um, to just purely store electricity, it's not... Um, at the minute, the financials aren't there. Plus, there is going to be with the with the war that's going on at the minute, and um, the awful war. But um, there's going to be a shortage of rare earth metals, and that's going to shove the prices up accordingly, um, even further. Um, as Eamon said, a DS3 scheme where we're doing grid support services under fast frequency response to respond and stabilize the grid under under dramatic outages, that would be one avenue, and we are exploring that with Eamon. But um. That's, that's just where it is at the minute. It's just exploration. Thanks. I'll try and fit in just one more. Um, uh, there's loads of questions there, but we'll try and fit in one because we're already after 15 minutes gone over. Um, Kevin Murphy asks, um, thanks very much for the presentation. A great project. Any issue with reflecting sunlight? Um, 
for, for the project. So I'll deal with that first, and then Luke, I'll yeah. hand over to you in terms of how you approach projects in general, because it's possibly a bigger issue elsewhere. So yes, uh, first of all, one of the questions that sometimes comes up that hasn't been asked is whether or not projects like this require an environmental impact assessment in the IAR. At the moment, a, nationally in terms of what the regulations are on that, but we took the approach in Lily that we would produce an EIR even though it wasn't clear whether we needed or not. We did all the relevant elements. And within that, you do a glint and glare study, which showed that our phase one development did not pose any issues uh, to anybody in the neighborhood. It was interesting, however, during the planning process, we were contacted by the Dublin Airport Authority, who are responsible for Cork Airport, because there's a holding area for aircraft going into Cork Airport that's about halfway between the site and Cork Airport. And they had queries about that very issue. Was there a chance of reflectance affecting uh, aircraft? We were able to show through our studies that actually the predominant re reflection of any is to the south and is away from that. And we satisfy their concerns. However, when it came to phase two, we were now looking at east-west panels as well as south panels. And we did identify in the Glinton Glare study that there was one very short period, I think it was two days and a few hours of each of those days, where one location where somebody was thinking of building a house, the house hasn't been built yet, might be impacted. But we've actually discussed that with our neighbour and agreed a plan that if there is an issue, we will adjust those panels and remove the problem. But overall, it wasn't an issue, but it was studied extensively. Maybe more generally, Luke, do you want to comment on, on those types of studies? Yeah, it's, um, as, as Eamon said, it's usually at Linton Glare. Um, so depending on where you are in the country, if you're near a, a train a train line, a flight path, um, any kind of hospitals or helicopter, emergency helicopter flight lines, um, you'll generally end up having to do with Linton Glare. So that's what we did for both phase one and phase two. Um, it's, and that Linton Glare is a very detailed report. It goes through basically every single minute of the entire day um, based on the sun's, sun's position in the sky and where the lint is going to go. So um, like we've had, I'd say we must be upwards of seven, 60, 70 lint and glare reports in the last two years. Um, we, have, we haven't had any failures. And one of our projects is literally at the end of um, Dublin Airport. And it's, it's facing over in, when we did the initial design, that sales stage, it was actually facing in towards the new control tower up at Dublin Airport. And um, even when we did the Linton glare on that, it passed within parameters. But just out of um, consideration for everybody, we altered that system. We increased the size and we changed it to an east-west mm. facing system so that there wouldn't be physically any glare at the at the, the tower. There is glare on the on the approachways, but they're all well under passing or well over, sorry, passing uh, passing requirements. And um, the IAA and the the FAA in America. Have, is, is who set the rules and they're they're fairly stringent but um so far um as i said we're 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 100 compliant on all of our sites and it usually comes back as a condition when you submit the planning that the um the county councils will say okay your location is in one of the flight paths or is in one of the risk zones and they'll they'll request the linton glare and i mentioned earlier about our new site in limerick that we're developing uh, even though the solar development there is going to be half the scale of our phase one development here, we've also done a comprehensive um, Clinton Glare study as part of that submission. Um, so hopefully that helps. Perfect. I think, look, there's a good few other questions there, but I think a lot of them have been kind of answered or touched on the presentation or they were asked earlier, and I think that they were covering presentation. Or the, the people can just, um, if, if uh, people can check your... Um, the, uh, it, there's, a, there's a video on the Engineers Ireland um, website as well that will cover a few of them. There's, a, there's, a, there's another presentation done previously yes. that might cover a couple of more. Um, I suppose that there's one last one there from Jordan. It's any chance of a site visit? And I've spoken to um, Eamon about this and Luke about this already. And hopefully in the summer, they, there is a possibility that there might be one coming up depending on how things work out. So just keep your... Keep an eye on the Cork Region website and our social media, and we'll we'll keep, we'll hopefully get one on the cards at some stage. Just to explain very quickly on that, just to you know, I mentioned at the very beginning that we're a site that does biological manufacturing. We make medicines through cell culture. Well, one of the problems with that is you can also grow viruses. So obviously the potential for any COVID contamination on our site would be very, very serious. It could take us out of business for a year. So accordingly, we still have significant COVID restrictions in place. In fact, many of our employees are not back on site yet because of that. Uh, but yes, in due course, you know, when things calm down, we'll see what we can do. 
So on that note, look, look there was there was nearly a half an hour of questions and answers there. So thanks very much for your time again, Luke and Eamon. And um, I think it was a, it was an excellent presentation, and it was even better to get the question and answers to dig even deeper into it. So uh, thanks thanks very much for giving for giving up your time this evening to Engineers Ireland. And um, thanks, yeah, I've, I've already said how, how good a presentation it was. We're, it's, very, it's very good. And if you want to check the chat there, there's, we had at one stage over, over 105 people present at the, at the okay, presentation. Good. And um, I, if you could check your chat there, everyone is very, very um, thankful for it. Thanks very much. Uh, and look, look if, there's, if there's any questions that weren't answered or any of the rest of it, Feel free to to pass them on, Patrick and myself and Eamon can come up can come up with written answers, I suppose, and they, they can get circulated around to attendees or something like that. I see that there's there's 24 of them there and there's more coming in. So um, look, if 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 that's if people want answers and they're and they and they do, I, I'm more than happy to, to facilitate that, you know. And and, and thanks million to Engineers and, Ireland for having us. We're delighted to to present the, the project. And I know from an inner power point of view, they were they were delighted to be with our with engineers Ireland twice this week for for engineers week encouraging people to 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 take up the mantle of engineering. And thank you on behalf of Lily as well. We're delighted to take part. We want to commend Engineers Ireland on the efforts, and particularly the efforts this week around encouraging uh, young people to look at STEM careers going forward. Um, uh, with respect to the questions, as Luke mentioned, absolutely, we can answer some of those offline. In addition, if there's anybody online who represents a company. Honestly, you'll understand I can't offer this to everybody because I'd, I'd be spend all my day answering questions. But if you represent a company who might be interested in something like this, this is part of the intent of this being a flagship development. I'm quite willing to talk to the principals of any company who might be interested in it. For example, last week I was talking to a linen company based in Wexford, uh, plant that, that does laundry. And they're looking at a, at a solar development on a field next to it. And uh, that's a good example of this particular initiative spreading beyond what we've done. So, which we'd love to see. So thanks, thanks very much. I think um, we'll, we'll leave it there. And um, thanks, thanks for offering. And if there's any few questions, I'll pull them together. I think majority of them have been asked and I think there was a few duplicates, but we'll run through them. And if there's anything we might, um, uh, in the sector support are going to send on the, the this section this is recorded so sector support are going to send on this to the people that were attending and if there's any question that popped up that you know you might want to answer we, we might we might add that to the email as well so thanks very much good thank you very much good thank night you. to everybody take care thank you Bye. thanks very Cheers. much and orla thanks for joining thanks for introducing us thank you yeah thanks orla thanks patrick thank you cheers Bye. Thanks.